thank you again, guys, for having me. And really bummed that I could not be there in person. I had a fantastic time at, at, at this course uh, two years ago. Uh, unfortunately, I had something that I just could not miss here locally today. But anyway, for the uh, sake of time, I'll go ahead and get started. So this talk is really about you know novel uh, applications and advancements in augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, so I will go ahead and get started. Yeah, here are my disclosures. As on site, I do have some uh, involvement with Augmetics and having uh, researched this technology and having had some hand in, uh, in its design. So uh, obviously this talk is in the subject of computer navigation and there's quite a bit of computer navigation options out there with what I consider first generation uh, really being manual computer navigation. And there's a whole different host of these. Most of them well, function via passive infrared tracking technology of an instrument and uh, tracking uh, based on uh, pre-registered uh, 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 three-dimensional anatomy via, via uh, intraoperative CT scan or a 2D fluoroscopic conversion to a preoperative CT scan, uh, with the only exception here being 7D surgical that does optical uh, structured lighting registration of the actual surface topography anatomy to a preoperative uh, CT scan. And then I think, yeah, you know, version 2.0 here is the marriage of computer navigation with robotic technology, which is uh, and essentially these are uh, rigid, uh, rigid troll cars that once they are locked on to a optimized trajectory, they stay locked on and uh, can achieve that ideal trajectory uh, for you without, uh, you know, minimizing your potential insertional errors. And there's a whole host of these out there. Uh, most of them are, uh, you know, semi-active where there, there is some shared control by the surgeon, but the, the robot has some semi-automation to it. Uh, and then there is the passive one brain lab circ that we saw a really nice demonstration of earlier today. Uh, the, these are a little bit more expensive, of course. And then now we have, you know, what the era of uh, uh, augmented reality, and this comes in different potential flavors. Uh, but the common theme is that there is some type of injection of a digital computer navigation image onto whatever display that the surgeon is looking through. Uh, so this can be a heads up display as seen here on the, on the left, where you have a headset that displays all the navigational data directly upon the, nav uh, the uh, surgical field. And you see the surgical field in conjunction with the navigational data. Uh, another uh, flavor of ice cream here is, I think this is called the Clara, Clarify system or Clari. It's not available in the United States. It's a Philips system. Uh, and this is uh, also labeled augmented reality, uh, not necessarily through a heads up display, but what they do is they uh, inject digital navigational image onto a video feed that's captured through the um, integrated R system and displayed on a remote display together. And then this system, I think this is by a company called Hollow Surgical. Um, it, I don't think it's also FDA approved yet, but it, it, I believe it's pending clearance. And what they do is they have this uh, translucent tablet-like device overlaid on the surgical field and you can see through it and see the surgical field itself. And it also displays the digital navigational image right over it so that you can uh, do your MIS navigation right through it. Uh, but to say the least, regardless of how fancy the technology that you are using, uh, a tool, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Uh, and I, you know, I think that these technologies are not necessarily going to uh, make you a, a, a good or great surgeon if you don't understand the anatomy uh, and have a, a, you know, a good surgical plan and a good sense of why you're doing the surgery and what the goals of surgery are. Uh, one question that I'm uh, often asked or well, when these topics come up is the mixing of virtual reality versus augmented reality. These are actually two uh, very, very different things. Virtual reality is something that is entirely different. This is something where the user is completely immersed within a digital uh, world. Uh, the senses are occluded. You don't have a sense of what's beyond the headset. Uh, so, it, you know, it's not any mixing of the real world with digital world. It's something that's completely immersive and uh, sensory occlusive. Uh, nonetheless, it has been found to have significant applications 
in uh, the clinical world. Uh, it's being used quite a bit right now for surgery rehearsal, surgical training, as well as patient education. Uh, if you've heard of surgical theater, I think they're one of the leaders in doing this and they're doing it quite well. It's amazing what type of simulations they can do uh, for both training surgeons, uh, demonstrating new procedures, as well as training patients. Contrast, again, augmented reality or mixed reality. This is where you find one way, uh, regardless of where you're using a heads-up display or a remote display to mix the real world with the digital world. Um, here's, uh, again, as I said, some examples of the virtual reality applications. Uh, Luis Tumilana at the Bear is quite active in doing this. They've developed their own platform for training the residents on placement of pedicle screw instrumentation within these entirely immersive digital worlds and have found that it does increase the, or decrease the learning curve for the residents and increase, increases their accuracy in placing screws. Here you can see the, the resident grabbing the instrument within this entirely digital world, picking an entry point and placing the screw. Uh, and they've done a number of you know, simulated trials where they demonstrate how uh, quickly the proficiency of instrumentation placement increases among those users. Again, going back to augmented reality, uh, my clinical experience has been with the heads up display as the other two systems that I brought up before are not currently available in the United States. Uh, so the type of augmented reality I'll discuss is the head mounted display type where the navigational data is directly displayed over the surgical field. Uh, as a disclosure, I only use this in about 5% of my cases when I'm doing uh, MIS procedures, percutaneous instrumentation. If I'm doing open surgery, I have not found a good way to incorporate computer navigation into my workflow quite yet. I freehand all of my instrumentation. It just seems to be a, a little bit faster, um, not as much of a, a workflow time sink uh, at an academic center where navigation can really put a... Uh, a downer on your day if things aren't available. So, uh, sorry, going back to the slide, if you use it for percutaneous procedures, what you're going to see is a three-dimensional model of the spine where you use that as if you're freehanding your screw to pick an entry point. Once you land on that entry point percutaneously, then you use the floating axial and sagittal projections to optimize the trajectory of the instrumentation. Now, the last time that I was here giving this talk, we had not yet gone beyond our first open cadaveric pedicle screw accuracy study. Uh, since then, we've done quite a bit more. We followed up with a percutaneous pedicle screw study. This was our landmark study where we demonstrated uh, a less than three millimeter and less than three degree angular and linear deviation errors. Uh, that was uh, what the FDA required for 510K clearance. Uh, since then, we have begun using it clinically. We published the first use of this uh, system in man use at Hopkins right before I left. Uh, and since then, we've published two large series. One of them, the first 205 open pedicle screws that were placed uh, at Hopkins, uh, some of them while I was still there. And then my series here at WashU, uh, where we published our first 63 perk screws using the system. Uh, these were graded by an independent radiologist that had no conflict of interest with the technology. Uh, and we were able to achieve 100% GERDS being accuracy. But, you know, importantly, we need to think about what else these augmented reality technologies can do for us beyond screw placement, because frankly, you know, we don't need to reinvent another way to place screws. Uh, you know, Roger Hartle, uh, is a big believer in using the augmented reality capabilities built already within many of the microscopes that we use to delineate the anatomy uh, and improve uh, our ability to resect the difficult lesions through smaller spaces. Uh, we use the augmented reality system that I discussed earlier to do uh, to cu couple it to a bone scalpel and do on block spondylectomies uh, while minimizing collateral tissue damage. Uh, and then there's a group out in Switzerland that's repurposing the Microsoft HoloLens to register the position of screw tulips and, and then come up with a uh, mixed reality rod template that the, the user can then bend manually uh, in an optimized uh, fashion to minimize the time that it takes to bend the rod, to minimize rod notching and to minimize in situ bending that can uh, put excessive uh, pull-out forces on your instrumentation. Uh, so briefly, I'll, I'll show two cases here. One, uh, this was a uh, 
58 year old gentleman with a 40 pack year history of smoking, uh, history of polytrauma, multiple compression fractures above and below, but now presents with this, sorry, with this uh, T11 pathologic compression fracture and severe spinal cord compression. Uh, it was challenging to think about how we were going to, you know, biomechanically stabilize this gentleman and still obtain a, a good decompression. So, you know, we did a uh, here to wash you a retropleural approach. We do the, uh, I do these on my own. We don't use thoracic, but they stay entirely retropleural, come down on the vertebral body, take the segmental artery, resect the tumor, very small incision. You flip the patient, little perk incision for the frame, for the registration, and then you can perk multiple fixation points in above and below given his osteoporosis and multiple compression fractures. Uh, we also cemented the screws given how um, osteoporotic and disease the vertebra above where to decrease the likelihood of screw failure. And you can see you, you can get a uh, rather large corpectomy uh, and end plate coverage through these small approaches. Uh, similarly, uh, we've also found that the system uh, is user intuitive enough to perform single position surgery. This was not a tumor case, uh, trauma case. Um, T12, you know, uh, uh, compression fracture, burst fracture with, you know, severe retropulsion into the spinal canal. Did a single position retropleural retroperitoneal approach to the perform the crepectomy, and in the single position, we're able to uh, instrument the spine. Uh, but in reality, if you're thinking, uh, if you're paying attention this far, and you're thinking, who cares? This is exactly what we can do with all the other technologies that are already out there. Why should we care about this? And I like to think about it as the natural progression of all technology. If you think about the natural progression of computing power, we see the, the first mainframe in universities and government facilities that took up entire rooms and could do no, not much more than maybe indexing a, a library. Uh, and now we have, you know, logarithmically greater computing power than that and the power of, you know, a small handheld device. I think medical devices should go in the same trajectory. And we see that in ultrasound technology. And I think that we have been going in the wrong direction with our navigation. You know, when you go back to truly the first stereotactic system, the ISG-1, which was a, you know, mechanical stereotactic navigation system that knew its uh, coordinates based on the uh, position of its different articulations to then, you know, passive infrared computer navigation, larger, and then we went even larger with modern robotics. I think it's time we go back to miniaturizing all the computing power that's going into this into very small devices that can do the exact same for a fraction of the cost with no comprom compromise on the accuracy or the workflow. Uh, but beyond that, they also the headset devices. And again, Augmentix is one of them now, but there's gonna be many more on the market soon. Uh, and they, often, they all have uh, the same premise that by putting the tracking cameras directly on the headsets, they minimize line of sight interruptions, meaning if that camera is on the outside, like it is in conventional robotic and manual navigation, anything between that camera and your reference frame and your tool can block your navigation. But if you put the tracking camera directly in the headset, you eliminate what we call external light of sign obstructions. Of course, you can still have internal line of sight obstructions, which is essentially you're blocking yourself from seeing the navigation, but the external cues, meaning your assistant, the uh, drapes, uh, the scrub tech, the mayo, the position of the bed, all these things, they're no longer potential line of sight obstructions. Uh, and then ultimately, by putting these cameras directly above the surgical field and not having them in remote locations, what we're really going to eventually see is the um, using computer vision to understand what is happening in, in the live surgical field and have direct feedback loops going into the uh, computer system, re-processing re, uh, what's happening and providing the surgeon with real-time uh, intelligent feedback. Right now, this feedback loop is broken, right? right? The computer doesn't know anything that's happening beyond what was registered. It is, doesn't have the capability to register and re-register in real time. But when we put cameras directly on the headsets, and whoever, you know, this may be, but when that gives us the ability to use computer vision, whether it's lighter or structured lighting or whatever it is to constantly resample the surgical field visually, re-understand it and process it and provide the surgeon with live feedback of what has happened within the 
surgical field. And you can imagine getting lifetime, real-time feedback on, you know, how big of a decompression or uh, angular correction you've provided to your, to the spine. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you everybody for your time. And, uh, you know, thank you to my partners at WashU and the people who train there. Thanks, Camilo. That was great. Uh, any questions from the audience? Talk. Um, what do you see the AR, uh, VR sort of, uh, you kind of alluded it at the end um, for robotics, because to me, the navigation and robotics are sort of going into a direction of the total automation, all right? Um, and the AR, VR, the way it's being used right now is you're sort of, um, putting the control back into the surgeon, right? So you still have to, surgeon still has to pay attention and, and, and put the screws in, whereas the robotic platform is going, going into more, um, not visualization, but automated pedicle screw placement, maybe potentially osteotomy. So do you feel like the AR, VR is gonna diverge uh, or do you see it converging at some point? I, I think it's natural for it to converge. Um, I like robotics. I, I used a lot of robotics near the end of my training. Uh, I, I have a uh, maybe a, a conceptual problem with robotics that I just cannot get past. And that is, you know, the robot is accurate 95 to 99% of the time. Um, but the problem with the robot is that you have to trust it at blind faith. You don't really get to use, or, or maybe you get to trust it too much and you don't use a lot of the uh, reconciliation tactile and auditory feedback that you normally would use in with manual navigation, whether that's stealth or AR or whatever. And if there's been a frame shift or whatnot, that the, you know, those screws can go into catastrophic places that people would otherwise not, would not have done with conventional freehand or fluoro or manual navigation techniques. So, I mean, they, they, these frame shifts can really be catastrophic. I've seen them. Um, and I don't know that that's ever going to be perfect, uh, because, you know, there's always going to be a source of human error. And, you know, you find that in these cases, it's not necessarily the robot that was misperforming. It's human error that was not recognized that the frame was maybe put on incorrectly or that it shifted a little bit and it was trusted too much, et cetera. And it makes us too comfortable. Um, I think when you have to use manual navigation, whether it's a passive system like the one you showed today where you really have to feel, does it, I feel my finger, is the TP there? Do I like it? Okay, now I'm going to commit to this and then I'll lock on my trajectory. I think that's different. And that's what we do with manual or passive robotics like you showed today. I think that's different because you're still, you know, before you trust the system, you're testing it. You're, you're questioning it. Uh, and un until robotics somehow is able to completely get rid of that, I don't think that it's, it's going to be that great. And I think everybody in this room has seen it and seen the pictures and, you know, people text them to each other of, you know, the frame shift or the screws are in the canal and like a perfect, like everything moved to the left or to the right, but the screws ended up to the canal and the foramen. And you're like, this would have never happened had I not been trusting that technology a hundred percent with blind faith. 